The 4GT name is one of the most respected names out there. The racing history behind it makes every car that carries this name very special. So unsurprisingly Ford has always tried to do something with this name, with introducing a new car basically every decade. But from all these cars, some concepts, some production, one has managed to stay on top as the most interesting and fascinating one. And this is without a doubt the GT90. The design, the engine, everything makes this car really special. But the fact that never made it into production makes the story of it quite sad. The only production GT that can top uh, this car, at least for me, is the original GT40. And that's just for historical reasons. Now, personally, I like the 04 GT, but the GT90 is just something else. While for a number of reasons, which I'm going to discuss later, I'm not a big fan of the new GT. So hello guys and welcome back to another video and here is the story of the GT90, the greatest concept ever. Now before talking about the GT90, let's talk about the Ford GT name first. Since I'm working on a video about the GT40 and the rivalry between Enzo Ferrari and Henry Ford II, I'm not going to talk much about it here. But so long story short, everything started when Enzo refused to sell the company to Ford for a number of disagreements that the two men had with each other. So Henry II decided to beat Enzo at the most famous and prestigious race, at the 24 hour of Le Mans. After lots of testing and millions of dollars spent, Ford finally introduced the GT40 in 1964. But Ford managed to find the right formula only by 1966, out of four consecutive titles. Since the GT40 raced on the prototype class, Ford never built an official road-going version of it, even though they sold some cars in a road-going configuration but many racing GT40s were turned into road-going cars by different specialists. But like I said, more about the GT40 on another video. In 1971, Ford would introduce the GT70, which, like its father, was built to become a racing legend. Just that with the GT70, Ford was aiming for the World Rallying Championship. The idea was that the GT70 would go against cars like Porsche 911 and Alpine A110, but most importantly against the Stratos of Lancia, since Ford was following basically the same formula. The most interesting thing is that both cars were presented at the 1971 Turing Motor Show, and this is something that would, would have made the rivalry between Lancia and Ford very interesting. Ford decided to use a 3-liter V6 engine for the GT70, which was mounted to a ZF gearbox, so basically the same formula with most of the Aureli cars at the time. The body was designed by Filippo Sapino at GIA, which Ford had bought one year prior. The GT70 wasn't just a show of concept, since Ford actually entered the car in some races in 1971 but with no success. Ford of France took hold of the car and later used the GT70 in some national races, until 1973. Through this time, the GT70 went through a number of different changes, including here a BDA straight 4 Cosworth engine, but again failed to find the success of the GT40. The main problem that Ford faced with the GT70 were the new regulations that FIA introduced in 1971. And so, with these new rules, they decided to continue with the Escort instead, which wasn't a bad decision after all. Differently from the 40 and the 70, the GT80 followed another road. The main thing was that the car wasn't built by Ford, but by Luigi Colani. Colani is one of the most unique car designers out there. His main focus are the aerodynamics and the material used on the structure and the body of the car. Colani started working on the GT80 in the early 80s, just that back then the car still hadn't received the GT80 name. Like most of the Colani cars, this concept was built for future application, mostly for racing cars. The main thing about this prototype was that the body of the car formed an inverted wing, 
which Colani called it C form. C, of course, standing for Colani. Colani continued to work with his concept and he presented even a working prototype, since the previous car had just been a clay model. The GT80 used a Cosworth 3.4 liter V6 engine. This was the same engine which was used by Formula 5000, with 400 horsepower and a drag efficiency of 0.2, the GT80 would have been a totally ridiculous car. Plus introduced many features which cars only have started to use now. And now let's talk about the GT90. Now the GT90 has a bit of a weird story. Ford started working on the GT90 somewhere around 1994 and the car was going to be built as a spiritual successor to the GT40 and at the same time would celebrate the 30th anniversary of the GT40. Now back then Ford owned, owned many brands and most importantly Jaguar. Ford had acquired Jaguar back in 1990 and so they carried mo most of the development of the XJ220 which was an amazing car on its own right. So they decided to use the XJ20 chassis as a base for the GT90. For the engine, Ford decided to go totally mental by building a V12. This was done in a quite weird fashion, since Ford took two modular V8s of which had two cylinders removed and were molded together. But Ford didn't stop here since they mounted four Garrett turbochargers. In the end, the engine produced 720 horsepower and 660 pound-foot of torque. These were enough to reach 100 in 3 seconds and to reach a top speed of over 370 km per hour. All this would have made the GT90 the fastest car in the world back then. But of course, the most memorable thing about the GT90 is the design. Even 20 years later, the car still looks amazing. Despite being a spiritual successor to the original GT40, the GT90 only had some design bits from the original car, so it wasn't just a retro-styled car. And like in many cases, the design language of the GT90 started appearing in other Ford cars. The interior also looked gorgeous with a mix of leather, aluminium and other materials. The GT90 made its debut at the 1995 Detroit Motor Show, but despite a great reception, Ford didn't change his mind. From the beginning, the GT90 was built just as a show car, and there were zero plans to enter the car into production. Now, there are a number of reasons why the GT90 never became a reality. Despite being a functional prototype, Ford still had lots of work to do in order to make the car ready, like they had problem with overheating and with handling the crazy power. So Ford would have needed at least another two years to make the car ready. So there were tons of work to do. But the main reason, at least in my opinion, is the XJ220. Like I have said many times before and probably you already know, the 90s were a bad time for supercars. Yeah, probably the best supercars of all time came from this decade, but most of them failed due to the economical crisis of the time. And the XJ220 was one of these supercars. Even though the XJ220 might have been a bit different compared to the others, since the cancellation of the original V12 four-wheel drive concept really hurt the sales of the final car. But other cars like the EB110 and F50 also had poor sales. The prototype costed for the 3 million dollars. And this was just for a simple prototype which wasn't fully functional. But the GT90 did its job. Despite the car never entering, entering production, people still talk about it. And in the end, that's what, what Ford wanted. The best car to compare to GT90 is the new GT, since the Ford GT of 2004 was a praying homage to the GT40 and wasn't as crazy as these two cars are. Personally, I'm not a big fan of the new GT, since first is the design which doesn't work for me, but most importantly the car doesn't 
doesn't feel that special. It's a great car in every term, but it misses something, at least in my opinion. So guys, thank you for watching and see you next time.